Vipassana on the 18th of September, 1962. The way to listen to a desana is to focus your attention in the present. Don't send the mind outward, but keep it fixed within. This is for the purpose of truly experiencing the taste of Dhamma right in your heart. It has been expounded that one may gain five benefits while listening to a desana. The benefits that will bear fruits in the future are additional side benefits. For this reason, there were many Buddhist followers who became enlightened while listening to the Lord Buddha's Dhamma elucidation. It was because they all had set up their citta correctly and were not concerned with the past or the future, but were only aware of the present, being solely receptive and ready to experience the taste of Dhamma that the Lord was expounding at that time. When the Lord first went forth into homelessness, He did so with an extremely great interest in Dhamma. Even prior to this, He had been fascinated and concerned from the moment He successively caught sight of the four Devadutas, Signs, they are an old man, a sick man, a dead man, and a holy man, to the day of his renunciation. He then strove with diligent effort in his austere practices and paid attention to his task and undertaking from the first day of his going forth to the day of his enlightenment. Neither did he ever abandon his pursuit, nor relent in his exertion. Laziness, discouragement, and weakness could not prevail over his heart, as they could over the hearts of all the other sentient beings. Likewise, with all the Savaka, who went forth following the example of the Lord, with interest and the aspiration to be free from dukkha. When they listened to each word of the Lord's Dhamma, they did so with attentiveness and took them up and practiced with devotion. They lived, came or went with mindfulness. Every facet of exertion was truly attended with reflection and application of the truth principle. The results and the rewards of the interest and devotion seems to differ from those of our time. This is due to the immense difference in the appreciation of Dhamma and the intensity of practice. If such is the case, how can the result be the same? The Lord Buddha never relented, never relaxed in the pursuit of his quest from the first day of his endeavor to the day of his enlightenment when he had finally attained to his goal and became the Sasada, the great teacher of the world. He then brought the Dhamma out to the Buddhist company by teaching and exhorting them following the path of Dhamma by which he already had experienced the results. Those who had received the Dhamma transmitted by the Lord were all joyful and delighted in the essence of Dhamma. Having taken it up and applied it to their practice, they had all in due course of time gained to the various Dhamma attainments and acquired the Dhamma eye like the Lord had before them. From the beginning, the Lord Buddha was the example and ideal of the Buddhist company. This can be seen from the way he practiced. 
he always spent his time living in the forest. When he renounced the home life, he went forth into the forest. Never did he take interest in anybody, not even the kingdom which he had left behind and all the people whom he had ruled over and given peace and security. He was no longer concerned about his princely status, but courageously and unflinchingly stood up to the ordeal of his exertion. In this respect, no one can surpass the Lord. Every mode of practice that he carried out always transcended the world. His renunciation and going forth into homelessness differed from the way of the world. So when the result bore fruit, they also differed. They were now of two different worlds, as his heart had been transformed into the purified heart of a Buddha. The results of his attainment must therefore stand in contrast to the rest of the world. This was also true in the case of the Savaka, who had gone forth and followed the Lord Buddha. When they heard the fundamental instruction given by the Lord himself, they were highly elated, jubilant, and satisfied. The Lord had exhorted them thus, Rukkamula Seinasanang, Nitsaya Babacha, Tatavo, Yavajiwang, Usaho Karaniyo. This, in our own words, would mean, Look yonder, there's a mountain, a deep forest. There are the mountain sides, there are the canyons, there are the creeks, streams, cliffs, hilltops, mountain slopes. There are the waterfronts and rivers by the hillside. These are places of ease and quietude, free from all forms of entanglement. You should all seek this kind of location and strive in these environments. The Tathagata attained his Buddhahood from this settings and surroundings. He did not become enlightened through mingling and socializing. Neither did he become enlightened through indulgence in mirth and gaiety. Following the flow of tanha, self-seeking ambitions and obsessions, which influence and drag one away through the power of the gilesas and tanhas, the Tathagata, on the contrary, attained to his enlightenment in those secluded and solitary places. Those were the spots where he strove in his strenuous exertion, where he escaped from every class of people, from his palace and city, so he could remain in such surroundings. The dukkha that the Tathagata went through was the dukkha born and derived from his exertion in those secluded and remote places. The Tathagata did not become enlightened amidst the grandeur and magnificence of palaces, at crossroads, or marketplaces, or in the midst of the crowds and multitudes. The Tathagata attained to his enlightenment in solitude and seclusion, totally retired from the world. The Tathagata accomplished and arrived at the state of purity of a Buddha in these out-of-the-way places. For this reason, may all of you turn to these places that the Tathagata has described for you. They are the mountains, hillsides, caves, under shady trees, in deep forests, in open spaces where the air is light and clear. These places 
are deserted and quiet, free from confusions and troubles. These places are not wanted by people, so you should seek for them and live there, for such locations are where the Tathagata attain his Buddhahood. If all of you aspire for the state free from dukkha, following the example of the Tathagata, you must go to these places that the Tathagata has pointed out. Then you will definitely one day follow the Tathagata in being rid of lives and existences. The repeated birth and deaths, which are like a pit of glowing coal. What was explainable was the second fundamental instruction. The first instruction said, Bangsakula, Jivarang, and etc. All of you who have gone forth should seek for discarded materials left in the cemeteries or along the roadsides, and stitch and sew them up together to make your lower rope, upper rope, and outer rope, so they may be used to protect your body and maintain from day to day your holy life. This will accord with your recluse ship and Spartan existence in following the way of Dhamma, by subsisting frugally on the four requisites of living, that is, fruit, shelter, clothing, and medicine, and being content with little, satisfied with whatever requisites there may be, and not indulging in excessive and extra extravagant squandering of this recluse temporary requisites of living. You may, however, simply accept the gift of robes presented by lay devotees as it is the way of simplicity and moderation, being easily fed and taken care of, and poses no problems and concerns to the faithful supporters. The third instruction was, Bindiya, Rupa, Bojanang, and etc. Having gone forth in the sasana, the way of Buddhism, you must not be lazy. You should go on Bintapada, arms round, feeding yourself by your own effort and on your own two feet, with a pure and honest heart. All the faithful supporters and lay devotees happily and willingly offer the gift of food following the Samana, holy man of recluse tradition, without involving the usual transaction of money in the way that people generally follow. The practice and observance of going on Bindabhata as the means of feeding yourself is the pure and impeccable livelihood for one who has gone forth. You should try to maintain this practice for the rest of your life. You should consider any abundance and excess which might occur as an exceptional circumstance when you have to oblige the laity. But you must never become heedless and complacent by taking the shower of gifts as reflecting your honor and dignity, because they will then turn into Sakaro Purisang Hanti. Gifts and offerings kill the unworthy. The bait kills the fish. The fourth instruction. Gilana e Sajja refers to medicine for the remedy of illness, which can afflict both pickles and lay people alike when conditions arise. Correspondingly, the cure must follow like its shadow. 
One know and exercise moderation in requesting assistance from relatives or those supporters who volunteer their service. One must keep it well within the bound of propriety. Knowing moderation is the necessary dhamma which one who has gone forth must always bear in mind. He would then become a sangha sopana, graceful recluse, who adorns the sasana by fellow Buddhists and the public at large. The important point which a bhikkhu must take into consideration is to be cautious and wary of excessiveness and in moderation in dealing with every form of solicitation with the exception of going on bindapata which is the daily observance practiced by bhikkhus and novices. One should never make a habit of visiting and soliciting cooperation from the lay people, but must always exercise moderation when dealing with any necessary situation. From the Lord Buddha, all the Savakas gladly took them up and practiced them with zealous devotion by going on their separate ways into the seclusion and solitude of the forests and mountains, unimpeded by concern for their life and well-being. Though they might have come from varying family backgrounds, some were kings and princes, they would not insist upon their status and position. This would only precipitate in them conceit, snobbery, and contempt for those requisites of living, food and lodging, that the lay supporters provided according to their means and resources. The Savaka welcome every kind of food, with the exception of those prohibited by the Vinaya court of discipline, for the sake of maintaining their life process and supporting a consistent practice and exertion. They were mindful of their exertion, practical duty, and observances, and were attracted and inclined to quiet and secluded surroundings, away from the noise, confusion, and all disturbing influences. Their exertion continued steadily and consistently, both day and night, and in all postures, standing, walking, sitting, and lying down. To them, nothing was more worthwhile and rewarding than the practice that would rid them of dukkha. All the savakas considered freedom from dukkha as the invaluable dhamma that is of more benefit than the repeated births and deaths which result from the deception of avicca, ignorance, the source that causes all sentient beings to ceaselessly suffer dukkha. As the savaka were all totally determined and dedicated to deliverance, neither pride of royal blood and wealthy family, nor pride of being a scholar or a learned person could creep into their hearts. For them, there were only the devotion and the application of their practices, the means that will lift the jitta out of dukkha. For this reason, all of them, from the first to the last arahant savaka, were able to gain enlightenment following the Lord Buddha. Therefore, May all of you practitioners turn your attention to the stories of the Lord Buddha and the Arahant Savaka and contemplate how they practice in order to arrive at satisfactory results, how they became famous and were revered and venerated by all the worldlings from every realm of Devata 
deities and people from all walks of life. No one can surpass the Lord Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha in wisdom, discernment, and accomplishment. For in all of this, they were supreme. May all of us dwell upon this, being easily discouraged and weakened, and being obsessed with food and sleep, are not the way to nobility and freedom from dukkha. They are incapable of making the Supreme Dhamma appear within the field of our awareness, which is our heart. In every movement and posture, standing, walking, sitting, and lying, one should always give heed to reason and constantly be observant of one's action. One should see that these actions don't make for delay or blemish one's body, speech, and heart. One should delight in seclusion and solitary existence and totally commit one's effort, both body and heart, solely into the work of exertion. One should have dogged determination as one's guide with every thought and movement pointing to the goal, freedom from dukkha. The outcome must then be irrefutably identical to that of the Lord Buddha and the Savaka, since it follows the same path. The Lord Buddha did not expound the Dhamma teaching, Sammaditi, right view, and Samma Sangkapo, right thought, for instance, for just anybody, but specifically to all of us who practice the way of sila, samadhi, and panya, morality, calm, and stability of heart and wisdom. Once having thought the path pointed out to us by the Lord, and lived and practiced, following the fundamental instruction For example, Rukamula Sena Sanang, living at the foot of trees. The result can only be freedom from dukkha and the attainment to the natural eminence of the Buddha, Savaka, Buddha's noble disciple, which is the state of purity within one's heart. One must Always be mindful, whether one is standing, walking, sitting, or lying, excepting only when one is asleep, when it is beyond one's means. Be always inclined to the application of sati panya, mindfulness and wisdom, and strenuous effort. The reality of deliverance will then appear within one's heart. During the Lord Buddha's time, people listened to Dhamma with earnest interest, fixing the Dhamma they heard within their mind. They didn't allow the Dhamma to disperse and slip away. Neither did they listen for courtesy's sake, taking it merely as a ritual. Everything people do today, which includes all the bhikkhus here, become mere rituals. If one is not really dedicated and firmly determined for the freedom from dukkha, everything one does will all unconsciously turn into ritual. For instance, it would be a mere ritual if we walk Jangama to just keep up with the schedule we have set. Whether the jitta and sati are in tune with our exertion is still a matter of debate 
and consequently the forthcoming result will be different from what we have expected. And for what reason? Even though we may be walking Jangama, the citta is with everything except the Dhamma principle. What is the principle of Dhamma? The Dhamma principle is to be always mindful while striving in one's practice. Whether we are fixing our attention or investigating any particular theme of Dhamma or any condition, if the citta and sati are not being concentrated in these objects but are allowed to drift and wander to other places and aramana, drawn by their alluring and seductive power, an indication that the flow of the heart and the heart itself have already gone astray. Then the ensuing result must be contrary to Dhamma, being something else altogether. Such is the way when we are not observant of our action. By striving in the practice, just for the practice, we might then take the wrong view and criticize the sasana, decrying the Dhamma teaching of the Lord Buddha as not being the Niyā Nika Dhamma, capable of truly leading the practitioners of Dhamma away from Dukkha, and as not being equal to the claim that it is the Svākāta Dhamma, the well-taught Dhamma. In fact, the flow of our heart is constantly pulling toward the world, both by day and night. So please bear in mind that the world, either the inner the, or the external world, is different from the Dhamma aspired to by the Lord Buddha. The endeavor of the Lord Buddha and all the Savaka aimed at the Dhamma principle as the deliverance from Dukkha. Consequently, every turn of their exertion was for the effacing of blemishes until they were totally removed and they attained to the state of Bhutto, illumination, for the world to pay homage and respect to. They had attained to the consummation of Dhamma because their practices accorded with Dhamma. Such is the outcome when the means and ends fall together in complete harmony. But with us, though we may be really walking Jankama or sitting in Samadhi practice, our Samadhi is merely a stump-like Samadhi. This is when we actually fall asleep right in that samadhi practice. We do this many times, and some people may regularly do it, though the one who gives this talk cannot confirm it. But it is probably the case, since the results always turn out differently. If the cause accords with Dhamma, the result cannot be otherwise. Both the means and ends must correspond. It must be because we don't practice following the principle of Dhamma. Instead of walking Jankama or sitting in Samadhi with Sati in tune with our exertion and the Dhamma theme or the Sapava Dhamma process under investigation, the Jitta turns instead to some other thing by sending the flow of the heart, chasing after forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile objects. Furthermore, the Dhamma Ramana, mental objects, conceived right in the heart, are also about forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile objects, either those of the past or the future. The citta never stay in the present, 
for even a single moment. If this is the case, the result must always be mundane, since the flow of the jitta is constantly involved. The jitta, on the other hand, will also be mundane, being samudaya, the origin of dukkha, that afflicts our hearts with trouble and hardship. As a consequence, we find fault with the result. Why is there anxiety and worry? Why am I miserable today? We never take into consideration or realize that we perpetually instigate these unpleasantnesses by running at cross purposes with Dhamma. That's why the outcome has to be like it is. For this reason, all of us who practice must constantly fix within our minds the resolution to be free from dukkha. We must never allow our actions done through body, speech, and heart to deviate from the teaching of the Lord Buddha who taught us to seek for seclusion and solitude in the deep forests which are appropriate and conducive to our exertion. Never did he exhort anyone to live and practice in the market, at the crossroads, or in crowded places packed with people, as if such places would instantly enable us to arrive at the safe haven, free from dukkha. We must contemplate on what Rukamula Sena Sanang, living under trees, really means. Every facet of the Dhamma teaching, expounded by all the Buddhas, has behind it sound and justifiable reason, and is the basis of truth which will always impart benefits to those who observe and practice it. Therefore, the story of the Lord Buddha and the Savaka is a story of wonder and marvel in respect to how they cultivated the way and the ultimate achievement, being great teachers for the whole world. Whether he is a great teacher of the world or an ordinary one, he can only teach us on some occasions. The paramount importance is for us to take the Dhamma, the principle of truth and reason, which is the real essence of the great teacher, as the teacher who will constantly teach us. Then every action will always be made known to our teacher, which is our own heart. We must always bear this in mind and not be unmindful and absent-minded, or else we will never be able to keep to our course and survive, but will waste away our time uselessly. Don't ever entertain the thought that the day and night, either of the past, present, or future, is something exceptional or unusual. For they are all the self-same day and night. The Gilesas and Asavas are not dependent on time, but are involved with the heart and all the related environments and conditions. This is the most significant fact. Please investigate it. Wherever one goes, one should always have the great teacher guiding oneself. Whether one is sitting or lying down, or standing or walking, one should always be mindful of one's deportment. Without the basis of sati and panya, calm of heart and circumspection cannot arise. This is because sati, panya, and one's diligent effort 
are the protective fence or the Dhamma that vouches for them. All that is required is for us to keep within the bounds of sila, samadhi, and panya. As we tread the path with our strenuous exertion, we will then experience the realm free from dukkha, right within our own heart, without having to ask anyone else about it. Regardless of time, if the Savakata Dhamma is still extant in the world, and the one who listens takes it up for study and practices following its instruction with dedication, the result for him can only be the attainment of freedom from dukkha. This he will clearly perceive in his heart. Please keep this in mind and correct the problem in your heart or else you will steadily degenerate and will never be able to accomplish anything. If one is always mindful and constantly probes with panya into the Sapawa Dhamma, the body, for example, one will constantly come across the unusual and extraordinary knowledge. On the other hand, if one's strenuous exertion is discontinuous and spasmodic, then the forthcoming result will correspondingly be retarded. Therefore, one should try to cultivate and develop sati and panya to be constantly mindful and circumspect. This will definitely contribute to samadhi, firmness and stability of heart, and genuine wisdom in the way of panya, which arises due to the investigation of the body, vetana, jitta, and dhamma, or the investigation of the four arya satcha, noble th- of Dukkha, Samudaya, Niroda, and Maka. Please also understand that the Sati Patana and the Arya Saja are the Dhammas of the present, which are constantly exhibiting themselves right within our body and heart. In the Machima Patipada, middle way of practice, that is, the noble eightfold path. The Lord expounded Samadhiti, right view. There are right views of things in general, of specific things, or those of the subtle aspect of Dhamma. The right views of general Buddhist followers deal specifically with the belief in vice and virtue, that those who practice virtue reap the fruits of virtue, and those who practice evil reap the fruits of evil, and so on. They have the conviction that these things truly exist. This is one level of samadhiti, the specific understanding of the practitioner who investigates with panya the four sati patana or the four ariya satcha is another level of samadhiti. Here one contemplates the body, vetana, jitta and dhamma to see them as the three lakana, three characteristics of existence that they are all intrinsically anijang, dukkang, and anatta, impermanence, suffering, and not-self. One builds up one's faith and firm conviction in the Satya Dhamma by investigating the Tilakkana and by taking the Tilakkana inherent within the Sapava Dhamma as the path for Panya to follow. 
Moreover, one investigates the Arya Satya to perceive and realize that dukkha, which arises from the body and heart of oneself and all other beings, is something that one cannot remain heedless and complacent about. One also sees the harm of samudaya, the source that generates the dukkha, that all creatures must immeasurably and endlessly suffer. Consequently, one is then ready to dismantle and eradicate samudaya with panya, so that one may arrive at Niroda, the realm of the total cessation of dukkha. Samaditi, a right view of the subtle aspect of Dhamma, deals with the correct understanding of Dukkha as one form of truth, of Samudaya as another, of Niroda as another, and of Maka, Sila, Samadhi, and Panya as another form of truth. These are the correct view that neither voices opinion nor passes judgment on the Arya Satya and all the Sapava Dhamma everywhere. This is another level of Samadhiti. There are many levels of Samadhiti since there are practitioners with various Dhamma attainments. If there is only one level of samadhiti, panya cannot be of many grades. Since there are several grades of kilesas, producers of sadness and gloom, panya must correspondingly be of many grades. For this reason, samadhiti is also of many levels. The second path factor is Samma Sankapo, right thought. It is of three categories. The thought of non-oppression, the thought of friendliness, free from enmity and ill will, and the thought that frees one of entanglement and bonds. The thought of non-oppression refers to the regard for the welfare of one's fellow beings both people and animals alike. One must also pay attention to one's own well-being by not taxing and overburdening oneself. One does not meditate on the way one can inflict troubles and hardships on others due to one's volition. Neither does one give thought to the way one can bring degeneracy and moral turpitude upon oneself. For instance, by indulging in the habit of taking alcohol and narcotics like opium and heroin. The thought of amity means to refrain from having animosity and malevolence for other people and animals. One does not contemplate tyrannizing and trampling on others. Neither does one maliciously wish others to suffer illness and fall dead, nor contemplate self-immolation by the various methods that are regularly reported in the newspapers. This is due to wrong reflection. Before one's person was one's most valuable possession and precious to oneself. But due to wrong understanding, it now becomes inimical to oneself. This kind of story happens all the time. One should understand that this is the outcome of wrong thoughts and reasoning. One who truly safeguards and look after himself will immediately curb and restrain any wrong thoughts. As soon as the citta begins to conceive them within the heart, by relinquishing and abandoning them, 
how could he allow these wrong reflections to get out of hand to the point of committing suicide? Is this an example of loving oneself? To think in the way that releases one from entanglement in the manner people generally do is one form of the mundane thought of renunciation. For instance, thinking of delivering oneself from the bonds of poverty, want and hunger, to wealth and abundance. Another form of renunciation is in the practice of dana, sila and pavana, generosity, morality, and training in meditation practice and mind development. Here one thinks about contributing to the construction of roads, wells, and jadias, pagodas, maintaining and refurbishing old and dilapidated sacred shrines and relics, and building kutis, viharas, pikus, drawings, sala, assembly, pavilion, and other kinds of structures for the sake of merit and virtue, so that one may uplift oneself from the heap of dukkha. To contemplate and see the peril in birth, old age, illness, and death that are inherent within every form of sentient existence without exception. To discern that the life of one who has gone forth is conducive to the development of the way of sila, samadhi, and panya, the way that fulfills one's aspiration, and to make up one's mind to take the going forth, to become a nun, a piku, or a novice, is another kind of renunciation. A practitioner contemplates and investigates his subjects of meditation to release the citta from all mental hindrances. He utilizes all the various methods developed by perpetual analysis and reflection to eradicate the gilesas. He steadily removes the gilesas through the various stages right up to the automatic level of Sama Sangapo, right thought. By constantly probing and examining, he finally eliminates all the gilesas. This is the last category of Sama Sangapo and the end of the elaboration of this second path factor. The Lord spoke of the third path factor, Samma Waja, right speech. This includes speech about things in general and specifically the dialogue on Dhamma. Speaking words of the wise that are not detrimental to those who listen, speaking with reason that is impressive and eloquent, speaking politely, modestly, and unassumingly, and speaking in gratitude and appreciation of any class of people who have been kind and benevolent are one level of Sama Vaja. The most appropriate form of speech is to specifically talk about Dhamma. This is to solely speak about the Sadlega, purifying Dhamma, the means of removing the Gilesas. This includes talk of wanting little, of the Pikus living requisites, of Santosa, being content with whatever of these requisites are made available and accord with Dhamma. Of Asang Sakanika, 
not socializing and mingling with others. Of vivekata, seclusion and quietude of body and heart. Of viriya rampa, strenuous exertion and diligent effort. Of maintaining the purity of one's sila, moral precepts. Of the development of samadhi. Of the cultivation of panya. That will sharpen one's discernment. Of vimuti, the state of deliverance. And of vimuti, yana dasana, the clear penetrative reali- realization of deliverance. These are the subtle aspects of samma vaja. These are not vain talks or gossip but serious talks full of interest, appreciation and devotion for the exertion and application of these purifying dhammas. The Lord spoke of the fourth path factor, Samma Kamanto, right action or pursuit. There are right actions dealing with general mundane work, and that dealing with the work of Dhamma. Occupations that are not against the law, for example, farming or trading, falls within the bound of right undertaking. Likewise, with the building of temples and monasteries, or the practice of dana, generosity, sila, morality, and the development of of metta, pavana, loving kindness. These are another kind of right pursuit. The practice of walking jangama and sitting in samadhi is also another variety of right undertaking. Every movement of the body, speech and heart is gamma, action. Actions done by body, speech and heart are called dhamma. Correct and proper body actions, speech and thoughts are called samma gamanta, right pursuit. This right pursuit carries a wide and extensive meaning and is up to each individual to interpret and apply it for himself. This is because the world and Dhamma have always been paired together like the left and right arms of the same person. It is not possible to separate the world and Dhamma apart. The world has its work and similarly with Dhamma. Since the conditions and the makeup of people vary from case to case, their undertakings cannot be identical. For this reason, a lay person must pursue the works that befits his position, and the same way with one who follows the way of Dhamma, that is, one who has gone forth. He must take up the work that accords with his status. One should not allow one's undertaking to conflict with one's views. Each one will then have his own samma kamanta, right undertaking. Both the world and dhamma will steadily flourish with each passing day because everyone is contributing and helping it. The Lord spoke of the fifth path factor, samma archivo, right livelihood. This includes the feeding of one's mouth, which is the common form of livelihood of people and animals, the nourishing of the citta with aramanats that arise from contact is another kind of livelihood, the nurturing of the citta with the various levels of dhamma is another. The way of living 
that accords with Dhamma, not in violation of the law, like robbery and theft, is one form of Samma Archivo. One lives with what one can obtain to support one's life from day to day. Or if one is able to acquire things in abundance, in a way that accords with Dhamma, it is also an aspect of Samma Archivo. The nourishment of the heart with aramanats, mental objects, that arise due to contact of the heart with external objects, like forms of men and women, sounds, smells, tastes, and male and female body contacts, is another variety of Samma Ajivo. This includes anything that suits one's liking and keep one happy and cheerful, free from sadness and melancholy. One is constantly absorbed in pleasure and delight, which serves as the elixir of life. But should one pursue them in the wrong way, they could turn into poison, destroying the heart. This type of Samma Archivo is suitable to one in the world who knows the right measure of things, as well as propriety, bounds, and limits. Preventing the poisons of the world from affecting the heart, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body is the way of nurturing the heart with Dhamma. Every contact made with forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile objects, and mental objects, should always be contemplated in the light of Dhamma. One should not allow any affection or aversion to arise, for it will be a discomfort for the heart. The investigation that accords with Dhamma will provide and sustain the heart with the essence of Dhamma. The heart will experience bliss, contentment, and serenity. It will be saturated with Panya and discernment. One will then not seek after any Aramana that is poisonous and destructive to the heart, but will constantly provide and nourish the heart with Dhamma. One must always investigate in the light of Dhamma every contact between the internal ayatanas, sense organs, like the eyes and ears, for example, and the external ayatanas, sense objects, like sights and sounds, for instance, for true understanding and emancipation. One must never contemplate in the worldly-minded way, as it is the way of taking in fire to burn oneself with. This will only bring about anxiety and restlessness inside the heart. One must constantly screen and feed the heart with the aramanas of Dhamma. The essence of Dhamma is the nourishment of the heart. It will steadily sustain and protect the heart, keeping it secure. The foregoing discussion has been about one more type of Samma Archivo. The Lord spoke of the sixth path factor, Samma Vayamo, right exertion. There are four ways of exerting. The effort to prevent the accumulation of unwholesomeness within one's character and makeup. To get rid of anything unwholesome that has arisen. To develop and bring about wholesomeness. And the effort to maintain any wholesomeness that has already arisen. One must make them opanayiko, drawing inward by applying them to the level of Dhamma principle 
that one is in. But here, they will be drawn into the basis of samadhi and panya, as far as is appropriate. One must devote oneself to taking care of the jitta, that is, being obsessed and infatuated with the flow of tanha, craving, due to ignorance dragging it away. One must try to curb the restlessness and disquietude of the jitta with the disciplinary power of sati and panya. The way of sila, samadhi and panya is the dhamma that can rectify every kind of kilesa. One must strive to develop them within one's heart. If one aspires for nibbana and the total extinction of the fire of anxiety, one must not consider sila, samadhi and panya as sand and gravel. Once any level of sila, samadhi and panya has appeared within oneself, one must not let them slip away to negligence. One must nourish and develop them to full maturity, where they will be transformed into the makayana, supramundane knowledge of the path. That can obliterate all the gilesas, including those lying latent. The realm of vimuti, freedom, and nibbana, that was before perceived as the Dhamma beyond one's means and ability, will be the Dhamma immediately realized within one's heart. The instant all the kilesas have been eliminated. The Lord spoke of the seven path factor, Samma Sati, right mindfulness. This is the setting up of Sati to attend to one's exertion. Whatever Dhamma one uses as the heart's Aramana, for example, the recollection of Bhutto or Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. One should have Sati concentrating on that object. Or if one should focus one's attention in the four objects of Sati Patana, body, Vedana, Jitta, and Dhamma, whether for the development of Samadhi or in the investigation for the development of Panya. One must constantly have Sati minding and attending to every round of one's practice and exertion. This is one category of Samma Sati, right mindfulness. The Lord spoke of the eighth path factor, Samma Samadhi, right calm, firmness and stability of heart. This refers to the Samadhi that is imbued with Panya and not the stump-like Samadhi. It is also not the type of Samadhi that is constantly addicting both day and night. One has no inclination to investigate in the way of Panya because one thinks that this type of Samadhi is in itself an adequately exalted Dhamma. Instead, one criticizes Panya as being spurious. This kind of Samadhi is called Mitcha, incorrect Samadhi, and is not the samadhi that can truly deliver one from dukkha. To practice the samadhi that will free one from dukkha, one must focus one's attention on any particular dhamma principle or theme, that is to one's preference, having sati directing and guarding until the jitta manages to converge into samadhi. It doesn't matter what class of samadhi this may be. This is the right or correct samadhi 
as long as one can feel that one's jitta has calmed down or ceased from concocting the various thought processes and remains in singularity and isolation from all surrounding conditions for a time before withdrawing from that state. This is not the same as the samadhi in which once the jitta has converged, one loses track of day and night and becomes totally ignorant of whether one is still living or not. It is as if one is dead. It is only after the jitta has withdrawn that one realizes that it had entered into calm or wandered away into the blue. This is the stump-like samadhi because it resembles a stump without any consciousness. One should try to avoid or refrain from this type of samadhi. If one has already grown used to it, one must immediately change and remedy it. This sort of samadhi is found in the circle of those who practice. The way of remedy is to refrain from allowing the jitta to converge as it usually does. If one allows it to, it will always stick to that habit. One must rather compel it to take a tour of the body with sati firmly in control, going up and down over and over again until panya, maka, and pala, wisdom, path, and fruit are realized. The kind of samadhi that is samma, right or correct samadhi, is the one that has sati attending to the state of calm once the jitta has converged into samadhi. After the jitta has come out of samadhi, one should investigate in the way of panya, the various sapava dhammas that are found within the body and jitta. One should investigate when it is opportune and appropriate to do so. Samadhi and Panya are the Dhammas that are always interrelated. One should let one Samadhi drift away without paying attention to anything else. In short, these three Dhammas, Sati, Samadhi and Panya, are interrelated and inseparable. Samadhi and Panya take turns in taking the steps with sati minding and watching over them. The above eight path factors have been partly discussed from the principle of Dhamma and partly from practical experience. Please note that the Dhammas from Sammaditi, right view, true to Samma Samadhi, are Dhammas comprising many levels. It's up to each listener to take them up and apply them in his practice as accords with his Dhamma attainment and ability. Regardless of whether one is a lay person or has gone forth, if one is interested, one can practice for the full development of these eight path factors, the fruits of vimuti, deliverance, and vimuti yana dasana, knowledge and insight of deliverance, will then be one's most valuable possession. This is because sila, samadhi, and panya are all found within this maga, the path, and they are like the key that will open and clearly reveal these two vimutis to the heart. Moreover, all of you who practice should not take the understanding that vimuti and vimuti yana datsana are separate from each other or that they perform two different functions. 
Truly, that's not so. When a man chops up wood with an axe, as soon as the wood is cut up, he both sees it with his eyes and at the same instant realizes it in his heart. In the same way, vimuti and vimuti yana dasana will simultaneously make one both perceive and experience the detachment of the gilesas from the heart, which is accomplished by way of sila, samadhi, and panya. Thereafter, there can be no more f- fussing with any problems, because all the bothersome issues arise from the conflict between the heart and the gilesas. This is the greatest of all issues in the three realms of existence. Once the heart, which is the cardinal problem, is let go, the gilesas, which resides in and live off the heart, will naturally fall away. Furthermore, sila, samadhi, and panya, and vimuti and vimuti yana dasana, are all left as they really are. They are all real, and consequently, all the contentious issues come to an end. Today, I have presented a talk on Dhamma to all of you who practice by highlighting the example of the Lord Buddha and the Savaka so that it may serve as a guide pointing out to you the way and so that you can set your compass, your modes of practices, relentlessly striving to follow the way of the Lord Buddha. Once you have fully developed the dhammas of sila, samadhi, and panya. Then vimuti and vimuti yana dasana, the essence of nibbana, will undoubtedly be your possession. For this reason, may all of you listeners set up the understanding that all the aforementioned dhammas are found right in your body and heart. Please draw them inward as your own possession. Then, both the cultivation of the means and its fruits of vimuti and nibbana that I have illustrated will all belong to you, either today or sometime in the future. May this desana now comes to its Conclusion. Evang, such is the way.